Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wheeler Centre. Thank you so much for coming. Actually, it's better if I take those off. And I put them on, I'll take them off. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm George McEncrow. I am your host this evening. And I'd like to welcome you all to the first of a series of talks that I'm doing on births, obviously tonight, and the next one is deaths, and then the last one is marriages, the big ticket items, because we just don't have time to fuck around. So we're going to get straight into the serious issues of life. Uh, death, birth, marriage, everything that matters. And uh, I'd ask you at this point to turn your mobile phones off. That would be terrific if you could turn those off. And, um, and look, I'd just like to see a show of hands. Anyone here who has given birth? Hands up. <laughs> Excellent. All right, you're all qualified. Anyone here witnessed another person giving birth? Okay, so we've got some very good, well-versed people in the audience. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. It is great to have you here. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our guest. Also, I should say, I have had four children. I know, I know you wouldn't believe it to look at me. I know. It is not fair, the way my figures snap back. I tell you what. Uh, but there you go, did. Uh, whatever, don't be jealous. So, our first guest is the wonderful Professor Jane Fisher. Jane is the Director of Research uh, at the Jean Hales, Head of Women's Mental Health, Monash School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine. Uh, Jane is an academic clinical psychologist with a long-standing interest in the links between women's reproductive health and mental health from adolescence to midlife, in particular related to fertility, conception, pregnancy, birth and the postpartum period. She has carried out many studies in clinical and community settings in Australia and Vietnam and a number of nationally funded intervention trials. Uh, Professor Fisher is also an expert technical advisor to the international agencies including the WHO, the World Health Organization and the United Nations Population Fund. So she's clearly a bit stupid, but welcome her anyway, <laughs> Professor Jane Fisher. <laughs> Wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank and you. also a broadcaster, which is where I came across uh, Jane, which was on the wireless. So it was a real joy to have you join us this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Next in line is Kaz Cook, who many of you will know. Uh, Kaz is an Australian author, cartoonist, broadcaster, researcher, public speaker. Kaz is Australia's number one trusted advisor for girls and women. Her books have sustained two generations of Australian women with very down-to-earth, sensible advice, backed up by medical uh, experts and other consultants, delivered in a very fun, friendly, readable way. Award-winning and best-selling books include Up the Duff, The Real Guide to Pregnancy, Kid Wrangling, Looking After Babies, Toddlers and Preschoolers, Girl Stuff, your full-on guide to the teen years, and the big mummer of them all, Women's Stuff. Kaz's work is also available in ebook and app form. There's a little plug. Kaz's career spans more than 30 years of journalism, writing columns, cartooning, radio shows, traditional and digital publishing, public speaking, and eating toast. She lives with her family in Melbourne. Welcome, Kaz. Thank, thank you so George, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another, another underachiever on our panel. Uh, Monica Ducks is no stranger to the Wheeler Centre either. Monica's been here many times. Is a writer, social commentator and co-author of The Great Feminist Denial. Uh, her second book, Things I Didn't Expect When I Was Expecting on Pregnancy, Birth and Motherhood uh, has been published since March and that's been going very well. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, it's going great. Good, good. Talk it up, talk it up, Monica. Uh, Monica was born in Sydney and studied for her undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney before moving to Melbourne, and we're so glad she did, where she worked as an academic research assistant. She later taught in the history department at Melbourne Uni while writing a PhD on one of her favourite topics, venereal disease. <laughs> You all wanted to write a PhD on that, I know. Every Catholic girl does. Every Catholic girl. That's so true. Having grown out of this fascination, she abandoned her thesis and fled the academy into publishing. Since then, Monica has worked on the monthly magazine at Melbourne University Publishing and was the founding editor of the interdisciplinary journal Traffic. In 2005, she began publishing her own work. Monica is a founding board member of the Stella Prize, an annual literary prize that celebrates Australian women's <laughs> writing. Welcome, Monica. So, birth. What does it mean? What does it mean to birth. Jane, I'm going to start with you. 
Well, ideally, birth, I think, is a transformative event. Mm -hmm. And it's transformative uh, clearly for the baby who emerges into the world from the safe intrauterine environment. But ideally, it's transformative for the baby's parents. But we know that many things can abstract that process. Mm -hmm. And perhaps some of those are things we'll talk about Tomorrow. Oh, you bet <laughs> your bottom dollar we will. Uh, there'll be a lot of talk about that. What is the difference between birth and delivery? If I delivered a baby that was perhaps not alive, have I still been said to have d given birth? Well, I think you, you point out something really important here. I think our use of words is just crucial. Mm -hmm. Delivery is actually, in my opinion, a rather passive account. It's something that somebody else does to you. Mm -hmm. And birth, I think, is the accurate and ideal word to use, that however your baby is born, it ideally is done in a way that enables you to feel you've given birth. Okay, so I would rather that someone had delivered mine <laughs> in, in some kind of parcel, I think. <laughs> frankly. Yeah, I, I, the I process, thought a lot about that. The thing. process is crucial. Psychologically, the process yeah. is crucial. And it does floor you when one of my, ch well, three of my boys ended up being caesareans. And somebody, when I said oh, I've, you know, given birth four times, a, a frenemy of mine said, well, <laughs> three Caesars. <gasps> Yeah. Is she still your friend? No, nah, I ran yeah. her over in my car. No, <laughs> no, I didn't. She's still on the scene, but I don't talk to her. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting, that idea that yeah. you just sat and noth did nothing. And, and, you know, because actually I felt yeah. Yeah. like I had cheated. Yeah. Um, well, certainly uh, an inaccurate understanding of caesarean birth is widespread. Mm. My PhD, longer ago than yours, was about caesarean birth. Okay. So it's a topic about which I feel very strongly. Um, it's used far too frequently in Australia. It's certainly used for reasons which are not clinically indicated. But when it does happen, uh, I think all too often the difficulties that it involves are underestimated. Women mm. get very little support, I, I, I think, when they have seizures. I mean, even yeah. I, I, that idea that you have this major abdominal surgery and if you were in any other situation, everyone would be kind of watching over you for weeks. Yeah. You kind of go home with a baby and everyone, you know, and don't drive. Mm. I love that they give that advice. Yeah, don't drive good. as if that's oh. going to happen. Oh. So. Yeah, that's, that's right. Don't lift heavy things yeah. Yeah. or anything, really. Yeah. 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 Snuggle up to the baby with yeah. your head. And, and nobody does come and make you a, a cake. But, yeah, your husband gets his prostate checked and, and some, people run over with biscuits. But anyway. Somehow it's meant better. to be pain-free, which uh, is yes. a, another completely inaccurate understanding. Well, 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 there was my next question that I wanted to get into, and I was going to address this with you, Kaz, because you've written several versions and gone over research over time. What are some of the biggest changes to the way in which we approach birth in Australia in the last, say, 20 years? Well, Up the Duff, which is the book I wrote about pregnancy, is about 15 years old. So that's I didn't know very much about pregnancy before I mm. was pregnant, before I wrote it. Um, in fact, I thought it was going to be like just walking around with a basketball up my frock, so my silhouette would be a bit different. And that but I was really it. surprised at almost everything. Right. Um, <laughs> because I knew nothing. I was really surprised that my nipples didn't have one hole like a garden hose. <laughs> I, I, did, I had no idea it was going to be a sprinkler. Oh, my God. Um, and I had no idea that your body would start to take over, you know, and, and that, that your physiological and physical self would be guided by the fact that your body was going, no, it's not just you. Mm -hmm. You can't just pull an all-nighter if you've got to get you know, something done for a deadline. So even while I was pregnant, I knew how much I didn't know. Yeah. But in that 15 years, um, I'm surprised at how um, little has changed in some ways. You know, I thought there would be lots of medical turnover of facts, and I'm actually re-checking all the details in Up the Duff at the moment for another reprint, because it's reprinted every couple of years, uh, every, sorry, about twice a year. And, um, you know, mostly it's just websites changing and the, the, the biggest change that worried me the most was a change in advice for SIDS oh, um, yeah. because that, it, 
It, no, well, I already knew. 15 years ago, it was already put the baby lying on their back. Um, but they said co-sleeping was fine. Mm. And then about two years ago, they said co-sleeping still a, a, is actually a, a big risk, even if you're not a smoker or a drug taker. So it really scares me when I see people with a secondhand copy of my book with the green cover, not the yellow one, because I want to go and say, you know, there's something wrong in there because I mm. worry so much about that you know the advice. information that I'm giving people. Yeah. Um, but in fact... Um, really big things don't change and I think I think that's interesting because even when they make medical breakthroughs it, it takes a long time for that to filter down like we will fairly soon have a blood test instead of having to do amnio and CVS you know more invasive tests to mm. um, to to analyze what's going on um, but but from the time when they first kind of think that happens and you know doing the, the studies and repeating the mm. findings and all of that um, it's quite a long time. I mean, but, but but what does change is attitudes and fashions. So attitudes and fashions, and um, and and the general thing that that I think every woman, I'm sure every person who has has given birth or been pregnant. Um, has experienced is suddenly you're judged like you've never been judged before. Yeah. And how you're judged might change on what the fashion is for what you, you know, and how old what you're supposed you to start feeding the baby oh and what God. you're supposed to wear and whether you're supposed to have a natural birth or or not and whether you're supposed to have a doula or, or a midwife or not. And those things kind of change. But what stays the same, I reckon, is a kind of harshness in that, in, in being judged, which I think comes from the fact that we, most of us don't know what we're doing. Mm. And I'm really happy to admit I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't have all the answers even after doing all of this. No, and you probably never will, sadly. I'm, I am quite only... dim, really. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you, don't, you don't get a chance to go back uh, yeah, and so redo yeah. what you perhaps... Well, I was just thinking, you know, I had a caesarean too, mm. and... Looking back, I know now that because my graph was going like that and the baby's heart rate was down, it was the, the obstetrician did what it was indicated in his kind of rules that he should do and do, do the cesarean. Mm. But probably my baby would have been fine without that in, intervention. Sure. But it's that chance, it's that risk yeah. that you that you take or don't take. And I think that's what one of the things that makes women feel very powerless. Because you're there, all you want is a healthy baby. You've got a medical team telling you those things. And they will take the most conservative path available to yeah. them because for fear of litigation. So Monica, Monica are you gonna say? Oh, I just, I think that one thing that has changed for you know, giving birth and for being a mother is risk that it has accelerated a lot. And there's a bigger frame there in terms of what risk is. I mean. You mean it's less risky to give birth now? No, I think that our awareness of risk has become quite overblown. And we see it in parenting, you know, that you can't... Like, we've just moved to a new house. Do we let our three-year-old go out the front yard on her <laughs> own? And I was thinking, I know 50 years ago, you know, I would have let her go out on the road, um, you know, yeah. go in and work. Drunk, probably, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> so I would have been. But, uh, no, I mean... But did you want to take a risk when you were pregnant? Like, I think no, it, I think, it, I think it, the risk is at your most bone. risk averse, though, at that you time, are, aren't you? because you're at your most vulnerable. Yeah. And, but I think that a lot of the risks are actually really overblown. And I think a really good example is alcohol. And this is something that, you know, they recommend you, you shouldn't drink at all. And the, 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 the kind of sense of risk about that has accelerated a lot. Yeah. And it's accelerated for white middle class women, essentially. We're the ones who won't drink. But there are all these issues for people with alcohol abuse mm -hmm. elsewhere. But when we're looking at our own kind of demographic, oh, we think it's... But, yeah. but none of the studies, there has been no study that has shown that small to moderate consumption of alcohol in early pregnancy has any effect. Now, it may, it may, and it's always that it may. Yeah. And I think when you're pregnant, Everything, like when I was pregnant, I mean, I've got a three and a seven-year-old, so it's more recent, I suppose, the pregnancy mm. experience. But I had things like how you sleep, that you should sleep on your left side. Mm. Because if you sleep on your right side, the blood flow could be compromised to your baby. And you read that, and you, and it's, it's all online, and you mm. think, oh. And so you end up having these really painful kind of, you know, six Enjoy months. Enjoy your blood flow, kid. Get in your blood flow. <laughs> Uh, well, and then I, I saw last year there was a study about they were linking stillbirth perhaps to sleeping on your back. There was yeah, some kind of something. Okay. Now, but what happens is those those little kind of truths 
feed so, in. So how does it, is that because some researcher writes a press release that gets then picked up by a newspaper, then it gets talked about on the radio, yeah, and but the, the suddenly... Yeah, what, what's the medical research view? Research is done about whole populations. Can I just get your microphone yep. a little bit and, closer? And Thank research you. about a whole group doesn't predict the risk for an individual. Sure. But that, of course, is how we interpret mm. it. And to some extent, we have to. And you asked about changes in birth. And I agree with Kaz. There hasn't been very much in the last 15 years. There's been a huge amount in the last 100 years. Yeah. So there's been enormous changes in where women give birth, who's present when they give birth, with the amount of technology available when they give birth. Who survives? Who survives. And that, and that's the, I suppose, the other side of it, is that it's a luxury for us in Australia mm. to be uh, mm. debating these matters. Mm. Yeah. In, in Australia, deaths, uh, pregnancy-related deaths are exceptionally rare. Yes, but, but particularly... Not very far away, pregnancy-related no. deaths are very common. Yeah. So um, these, these matters, I think, are... Of, of great importance of how do we take our more technologically sophisticated understanding of these relatively minor risks mm. and enable women still to have a pregnancy and an experience of giving birth that promotes confidence, not anxiety. Because yeah. I tell you, the latest kid on the block is if you worry too much, you've trashed oh, your kid. Yes. Oh, but they've, they've, oh, what, yeah. they've done those stress yeah. studies, because yeah. I, I find those fascinating. Yeah. They yeah. Cortisol they levels are through the roof. Yeah. But it's the <laughs> Netherlands. They did, you know, there was a, uh, you know about this, Jane, but the big study done in the Netherlands in World War II mm. where people were living under famine conditions. They were, I think they were yeah. blockaded in and it was, it was extreme. Ooh. So there were a few Nazis about, few for Nazis example. A few Nazis only about, but like, yeah, this good. was extreme, extreme conditions. Mm. And then they went back and looked at the, the children of these women, um, you know, 30 years later and there was a higher rate of, I think schizophrenia was one of them. And there were all these other problems that these children had. Mm. And it was the same they looked at in the Balkans. I think there was a similar study done. And it's like, then they come to women mm. like us and will say, you know, if you get a little bit stressed when you're pregnant, your child could end up with diabetes. Like, yeah, it's actually, exactly. and, you know, and it will all be your fault. It will all be your fault. No matter what you do. angry while you're putting the change table together. I blame Ikea. Um, <laughs> but that, that's what I wanted to do with Up the Duff is, apart from educate myself, I wanted to reassure people. Mm. And one of the things that I say, in particular about the alcohol thing, is you, you're not going to find a doctor who says drink as much as you like because it probably won't cause a problem. Mm. So if so what I say is, if you don't drink, then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Mm. If you don't drink more than two coffees a day when you're pregnant, then you never have to say to yourself, maybe it was that. Yeah. So, But where do you draw that line? See, that's what well, I, 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 because I, I think... My experience actually is, um, and I know exactly what you're saying about people being too worried about drinking, but my experience is women come up to me all the time going, come on, come on, I can have a drink, can't I? Just one drink a day, maybe two, maybe two. My sister-in-law, she had like three a day and her baby's fine. <laughs> you know, just, They're desperately wanting the permission. Yeah. But, but part of that though... And they do, a lot of them will still have well, a... A lot of people ignore that guideline. Yeah, like me. Mm. But I am... Um, my mother's generation were, you know, all of those women, and they all have had, you know, we were a small family of five. Many of our friends were 13, 10, 9 kids. Mm. Those mothers needed a drink, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Yeah, and and mum, mum tells hilarious stories. Oh, we were so drunk I fell out of bed feeding you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, there's a very different attitude to it. And, and looking around at those kids now, who are all in their 40s, they all do seem to be fine. They all went through school. They all went to university. They all, all you know, got into business, got on with their lives. But I think one of the things that seemed to me, and I'd like to talk to you about yeah. this, Jane, is that that slow eating away of self that happens, that, that you become public property, that, that your love of a really nice glass of Chardonnay at the end of a day is diminished and and the fact that you've always been somebody who started the day with a couple of short blacks or just bit by bit by bit mm. the child takes the identity now part of that i think is an essential requirement uh you know the growth that is so terribly shocking after you've had a baby is that actually i am no longer the person i mm. was I am a new person, um, and some of the anxiety that goes with retrieving your former self. What do you think about that link between the end of who you are and the beginning of this other person and sort of some 
either postnatal anxiety or depression, where does that come in, that identity issue come in? Well, I, I think women lose an enormous amount when they have a baby, but they're invisible losses. So overnight, especially when she has a first baby, she loses her professional identity, at least temporarily, her capacity to generate an income, her social and leisure activities, her liberty, her autonomy. Yeah. And for most of us, these are not losses we can readily name or recognise, and for sure no one has a funeral because you're not earning money anymore. Mm. But uh, our task psychologically is then to work out which of these can we restore, maybe in a changed way, which are gone forever, and then most importantly, what are the things I could never have known, never have done, if I hadn't uh, engaged mm. in this? But I think because these psychological tasks are so important and so demanding, it's better if your pregnancy was desired and intended and uh, created in circumstances where your needs were taken seriously. And that isn't the case always. Mm. And it's not even the case for anyone all the time. But I believe we have to take these psychological implications very seriously. The other one, of course, is that women are held responsible. Mm. And as everyone here knows, women are blamed all the time. <laughs> so mother blaming begins from conception and it continues throughout your child's life. And uh, certainly the blaming of women uh, in pregnancy for things that subsequently happen to their children has become a very fertile field of research. Mm -hmm. So that it now has a name, it's called the Developmental Origins of Human Disease. There are experts all over the world who say, you know, the heart attack at 56 is because the mother did mm. something in pregnancy. Or the grandmother. So, uh, and the studies grandmother. about what the grandmother does affects so the grandchild. It, oh, my kids uh, are in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a field where I think we have to continue to challenge the implications of those things that are done because they're scientifically intriguing and because they're easy to investigate. Well, pregnant women are a captive population in a hospital. Women are approached at the Royal Women's Hospital on average by 17 different researchers. Yeah, and, you, and you know it. And, yeah. and it never stops. Mm. And I remember mm. with my youngest, and he got very sick and I had to take him into the children's... It turned out he had a UTI. But I I was asked... And I don't I'd even had, know what that is. A urinary tract infection. Oh, and yeah. Common in little people. He was about six weeks old and he was very sick. And I'd had terrible trouble breastfeeding my first mm. child and the boys were fine. But um, I was asked 27 times if this child was breastfed. Mm. Now, it wasn't actually relevant <sighs> to the... They were just mm. taking their data. Mm. And I thought, thank God. God, yeah. I can say yes, because mm. if I'd had to say, no, 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 my sense of guilt, mm. responsibility, mm. I had this the very sick, gaze, febrile little mm. boy, mm. and it would have been all... So they weren't trying to be malicious, but, yeah. It, it is, I mean, and this goes back to the risk thing. I think the mm. whole frame of motherhood today is it's all about the individual. Like, mm. it all comes down to the mother, and I think when you have that first child in particular, and that terrible sense of loss and that grief, which... And you can feel really alone, even though it's yeah. something that so many alone. women go You're through. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't feel yeah. that connection necessarily. No. Yeah, and it all comes back to the mother rather than seeing that bigger frame and say, and it, mm. you know, when it comes to all the things that can go wrong. And with breastfeeding, we say, are you breastfeeding? Why are you not breastfeeding? We don't say, is it in the best interest of this woman whether she breastfeeds? Yes. You know, what's or how the much picture? are you breastfeeding? Maybe you are, but it's only once a week or yeah. something. Yeah. Mm. You're doing yeah. your best. And is there, yeah. is there a reason? So again, I was saying to Kaz, with, was one of the reasons I really wanted to mm -hmm. get into this topic because so many of these things happen. Um, my first birth ended in a postpartum hemorrhage and the only thing I really remember of that is losing my vision mm -hmm. uh, through blood loss and the nurses screaming, we are losing this mother, we are losing this mother as they rushed me into theatre. Mm -hmm. And a day later I'm sitting in bed, I had to have four transfusions, I lost two-thirds of my blood volume, I was in respiratory mm -hmm. failure. No one spoke to me about that event mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And oh. then I had this big, bonny, nine-pound girl, and I thought, oh, my God, she's enormous. I could hardly hold her. And then I, through my tiny, pitiful, toxic breast milk, managed to shrink her look like a sea monkey. <laughs> and I, they, she kept losing weight and losing weight and losing weight, and the maternal child oh, health yeah, woman would say, and are you putting baby to the breast? To which I wanted to say, no, I'm shoving her up my ass. What do you think? I'm putting <laughs> yes, I'm putting baby. But it took seven weeks until, and they would ask you things like, do you have wet nappies? And she did. She had one wet nappy a day with tiny pink 20-cent coin worth of urine on it. 
and nobody said to me, tell me about your birth. And finally, yeah. I got this woman who said, oh, you can't make milk. You need blood makes milk. You can't make milk. You didn't have any blood. Yeah. Get onto the formula and stop your nonsense. And she also said to me, crucially, feeding is a nutrition issue, not a moral issue. And mm. you've got to learn mm. to... Mm. But you know, that baby mm. could have died mm. Mm. and this, and I would have been seen in the records as having mm. attended child health. My father was a mm. GP. Mm. Um, you know, I'm an educated person. I'm in a mm. you know, very wealthy country and yet little bubs could have starved to death. Mm. How do we make sure what people don't know that they need to know when they have a baby? Well, I think we should give up any idea that it's intuitive. Oh, yeah, yeah here, here. Uh, here, here. One of the <laughs> things that uh, I think is crucial is that uh, providing high quality care to a baby is extraordinarily skilled work. Mm. But we don't name it as work. We say, oh, you've given up work or you're not working or he's <sighs> working and you're not. So I believe we should regard it as extraordinarily important work for the whole of society as well as for that baby. And we should provide people with very well-supported, well-timed opportunities to acquire the skills they need and to accept that sometimes things like breastfeeding don't function that well, but that all aspects of infant care, I think, require very sophisticated attunement and understanding and uh, practice and we don't do that. We, we can't acquire those skills if we criticised, observed, scrutinised, blamed uh, the sorts of experiences we've been hearing about. Mm. What happens, um, and you know all of you have done research in this field, do you notice a class distinction with pregnant women who approach public health services? Do you think, or well, Sometimes I remember my obstetricians and I'm saying, oh, I'm about to go and deliver an IVF baby, a very precious baby. And I used to think, does that mean there are babies that are less precious? And then anecdotally, I mean, I knew what he meant, and that's not to be mean. I understand if a couple's been trying to conceive for a considerable time, of course, you know, the one ovulation is successful, of course you understand what that means. But I also observed other women in the public health system and, in, and elsewhere, if you were perhaps um, a Maori woman with seven other children, that you might be treated as though your baby is a little bit yeah. less important. Um, or if you were young, mm. or if you were unemployed, or underemployed, or tattooed, or, um, you know, a range of sort of snobbery social filters would impact. Do you, any of you observed any of that in your research about class in Australia? N none of my research is scientific, so it's all anecdotal, for example, in surveys of women mm -hmm. um, sharing their thoughts and, and talking to women during research. But one thing I have noticed is that, um, and it's part of the judgmental thing, um, that teenage mothers are really frowned upon. I mean, people feel that they can actually say to a teenage mum on a tram, you know, you're too young to have a baby. Um, Unless you just hand it over and go, okay, yeah. thanks, I'm off to the pub. <laughs> um, and, and certainly I know that, that, that quite a few um, women and men who've waited a long time um, for a baby and have been doing something like IVF are really scared to reach out to services after a baby's born because they don't want to admit that they're not coping. Mm. And I think a lot of um, women who have been very successful in their career and have... Um, Wait and, and have, and let's face it, not a lot of us have experience with the big families anymore, mm. certainly not the atheist uh, family that I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's one of the things that, that, you know, as Jane touched on as well, um, we, have, we can't absorb this knowledge from nowhere. No. So, um, and, and I have noticed sometimes that there is a little bit of a sneering as you're supposed to have the in instinct. If you don't mm. know what to do, then you have sort of a lesser mother. Yeah. Um, that you should, that somehow you should know. That you should know what's wrong, for example. And what I've said to people is you can't know what's wrong until you can't develop instincts until you've had some time yeah um to yeah. know you to know your baby i wanted to ask you george you've had four yeah um from did it get easier did you feel more competent yeah. as time went I on i really peaked at three and yeah. at the third <laughs> that's when all my chickens came home to roost and then i was completely rooted with the fourth <laughs> i had it all and then i lost it all and i i don't know why i did that i, I still don't really know why i had four kids but 
I, and I had them all so close. I really don't. There's no good reason. There's no good reason really to justify having any child. But that's because ex- maternal desire is not rational. So okay. if you spend a lot of time thinking, is there a rational reason? Yeah, there's none. I think I'm never going to find no, one. No. Like it, there's it, no perfect time to have a baby either? Yeah. There's, there's or, probably a few times it's better not to have sure. a baby. Sure. Well, but, the, the, but, but there is never a perfect time. You know, never people think they have to have a certain amount of money. There's or, never a space I, I in your that, life for I love a baby. that line. When yeah. I got pregnant with my first, and you know, I was in my early 30s, yeah. and, and you know, my partner and I were in love. It was all fine. And yeah. I went to the GP after I took the test and yeah. was like in a panic. And she said, there's never a perfect time and that stayed with me because throughout everything because I think it is a shock and I think we do Mm. we idealise motherhood today I've got to lose the word perfect in front of anything really (laughs) to do with motherhood that whole sense that you are but and also that the baby it will all be easy and if it you know and you'll be different and all of that and realising it will always be. I think it will always be a shock, and it is always a profound oh. and extreme. And, and and if you have a difficult first birth, and many people do, I remember people bringing me flowers and popping champagne, thinking, "I, I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. You should be mourning. Mm. Why are you also? I mean, I had mm. an utterly joyless. I mean, I faked it because I didn't want anyone to think I was a psycho, but I was a psycho, mm. and I wasn't having a good time. But I wanted to pretend because. I thought I will feel so bad mm. to report actually what I'm feeling. I think we don't... Val- I mean, if we're talking about the act of giving birth again, mm. I think a lot of women, and a lot of women I've spoken to, and I know myself, I had two uncomplicated births, but I felt like it was a true... I mean, it was good in some ways. In other ways, I wanted to keep telling the story of that birth, and mm. I found with a lot of my mm. friends when they have babies... Trauma. You go to see them, yeah, and they mm. tell you the story as if they've just had a car crash, mm. you know, and then this happened and then this happened, and, mm. you know, and I, I think we don't really... And women postnatally are often... And, you know, women who lose babies, you still hear terrible stories about, you know, losing a baby in a hospital and still being on the maternity ward and all these... All of that. This Yeah, this lack of comprehension of the enormity of that actual process. Has, has that improved, Jane, in your... Studies. Look, I, I like to think it's improved yeah. a bit, but we're, really what we're talking about is we need care that's not only technically competent, it's highly psychologically competent. Mm. So it's aware that you were near death, you've had a terrifying experience, and you need support and assistance to acquire the language to describe what's happened to you. I think what you describe is really important, that for each of us, birth probably feels like the hardest or one of the hardest things we've done, but some births are very much harder than others and more uh, threatening to life. The baby's life can be at risk, so more uh, potentially traumatising. I think a lot of the more psychological research is being driven by midwifery rather than by obstetrics. And regrettably, in the power disparities we've already talked about, that takes longer for it to be recognised. It's easy for the methods to be dismissed, for it to be regarded as uh, anecdotal, not as quantifiable as uh, things that can be more readily measured. But overall, there have been some fantastic changes, I think. You know, 40 years ago, men were not allowed uh, in birthing suites. They're now expected to be there. Perhaps it's gone too far. But for most families, that's been a very beneficial change. Mm. I think I think especially when my grandmother used to joke, because she had six kids, that she'd go in and she'd say, oh, your grandfather would just think it's like pushing up a roller door and a baby comes out. Like, he never knew that mm. when she came home what she had been to. Yeah. And she said, I used to feel like I'd been to war and back, mm. and nobody was there no. waving a flag or you know, and no one and didn't make you a cup of tea. It, it, it's had great benefits, I think, in terms of men's sense of attachment to their infants from the beginning of life. And I'm sure that this is ultimately a, a beneficial mm. experience. And a sense of the heroism of women too in certain mm. circumstances Ab- as well. Unbelievable heroism. Yeah. And the support yeah. of men, I think, for women and their kids. I mean, it, I remember... Um, it's sort of gone out of fashion again now because a lot of this stuff comes in in waves or, you know, when the media gets interested. But remember there was this big thing about, you know, men shouldn't be there when babies are born because they shouldn't have to look at the vagina stretched out of shape because, you know, oh, that's the recreational, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was they like it was the local to... park, and you yeah. know. <laughs> and they, so they shouldn't have to watch it being moan. I mean, I, I, it yeah. was just really... It was so baby. It's just a girl, blah, 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 or you've yeah. got to watch where a baby comes from. Yeah. Hard and up. But Bunica. in fact, I think from, again, anecdotally, which is really what, what life is, 
I think there's a, a, a great respect and a great almost, I, mean, I don't know whether it's almost like a camaraderie of something that you go mm. through together as a family. Mm. Um, and that's one of the things too that I think would really improve the experience, the, 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 um, the experience of close to the birth is, is women not feeling so worried about, um, you know, doing the wrong thing or saying or appearing the, to be the wrong way or feeling the wrong thing so that men can take care of their babies too and get yeah. and, and develop their own instincts and not feel like they're doing the wrong thing or holding them the wrong way. Um, that we, we all need to be trained to be parents, women and, and men. Absolutely. Well that, well, that requires a sort of a broader issue, doesn't it? You know, like for the, for the four children I had, my husband managed four days off, right, mm. which was for the first and then none mm. again. Mm. Um, and if he did, then that would come off our holiday plan. And mm. I think, oh, don't, mm. you know, don't worry. Or he'd be at home minding the children. The minute I got mm. home from hospital, he was back at work. So there's no time together, really, to do that. And that's because of his workplace. Um, and I, I wonder how far we've come in bringing birth away from being an isolated sort of suburban female experience into this is what actually the community has to manage. I don't think we've come very far at all. I mean, in some ways we have. Like, mm. And I think it is those ways that the man can be there at the birth. But I think if you look at the way workplaces are structured, it's still very much aimed towards male breadwinner. And if you look at the logistics of it, men earn more than women in Australia. You know, there is this mm. pay rate. So if you have a baby, even if your partner wants to stay home, eventually who goes back to work? The person who has the bigger income. Mm. But, I mean, men, uh, you know, they even the parental leave scheme that's come in, this idea that, oh, well, the man will take a couple of weeks, you mm. know. And then with Tony Abbott's proposal, it's always about the mother. Mm. And I think we haven't really got that holistic idea of, you know, how care is is mm. shared and how we can enable that. And I think our, our workplaces are so family unfriendly, but they're even more so in some ways towards fathers because they don't actually respect the idea that a man would want to go home and look after his... And, and that, that does have a very negative flow-on effect where you become very competent and capable mm. and the person has only spent mm. a tenth of the time yeah. doing mm. it. Um, of course you come in, especially once you've had multiple mm. children, you know, you can do it in two mm. seconds flat and they'll all be in the car and they'll all be brushing, they'll all be processed and they'll all be in their little jammies yeah, which, and, you know... Which leads you to going, oh, don't, do I'll it. I'll just do it. Which is really, you know, the, you know, the technical is. term is gatekeeping. But I had a different experience. My partner was um, lucky enough to have um, kept his long service leave and took four months when our baby was born. Wow. And, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Um, and... And I really needed that. I really needed him to be home for that mm. time. And, and I was trying to work full, you know, <laughs> what? Trying to work full time as soon as I could. But I think as, aside from the workplace thing, which I think is so true, and, and my partner still, we try and do half and half or try and work it out. You know, nobody measures, but we, we try and do that. And I know that the, the men that he works with, many of them have never seen their kids awake. In, at night, you know, like they don't get to read the story, they don't. And he's taken knocks in terms of his work, sure. as, as women have as well. Yeah, sure. But I just wanted to say that I think a really relevant factor is also the way we live, that everybody, talking about that isolation, everyone's in their own little house mm -hmm. with the closed doors and, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a little bit different now with the mobile phone thing, Yeah. But um, which wasn't, you know, such a thing. That's actually a big change, 15 in the last well, 15 years, I you see women it. talking to or, their phone or even email. and their baby not interacting with, yeah. with their mum the because they're running off the edge of the train. Yeah, and then, and then, but, then, but also just that babies learn to interact and I'm, I bet we've all had the same experience as I did, which was one day hearing my daughter talking into a banana going, oh, <laughs> <laughs> great, that's exactly what I must sound like on the phone. The fake um, mother voice on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> but, but these have really important implications for public policy. About the only country that's doing it well in the world is some of the Scandinavian countries, particularly Sweden, where they do have not just optional public policies, but requirements for uh, leave to be taken, and it has to be shared between both parents. It has to be. Yeah. Oh, wow, and that's I, great. I think that there are models in the world. They, of course, have very high taxation rates, but uh, there is no doubt, I think, that while these things remain optional, 
this, it's seen as a less desirable thing what, to do. What, what are the ongoing consequences of that? Where do you see, if you were trying to sell that to an Australian government, where you'd say, well, okay, we, we invest here very heavily through these very heavily funded programs, but the, the down the track we get, what, fewer issues of other things? Well, um, I, I think that the very best investment we can make is in the first thousand days of a child's life. And in fact, this is Hillary Clinton's major international initiative, is to improve the first thousand days of every child's life. And that's from conception until their second birthday. And ideally, most of their care is provided by primary care providers to whom those children can form a close, enduring attachment. But it's not only to their mother. So I think we have to have public policies that emphasise the importance of fathering as well as mothering, of competent caregiving that begins from the very earliest part of life. But we have to have uh, public policy changes of a very broad kind mm -hmm. to implement that. I think you should be the Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, <go. laughs> we need to look at the mother as well, because I, yeah. I, I think this is funny that so much, and I, yeah. this has been a shift in the last half century, yeah. is that it used to be about the mother, and the mother was pregnant, the baby was mm. pretty much invisible, mm. but we do now focus so much more on this baby, and mm. what is the rest of the baby, and the baby's breastfed, all of that, and very, mm. very rarely do we look back at the mother, and I think mm. if you create better, you know, better attachments, all of that, the long-term consequences aren't just good for the baby, it's great for the mother. And, and I think that point you made earlier, Jane, that one of the things that I think a lot of men are under-versed in, and I think women too, but, but it would be particularly helpful uh, if whoever is supporting the mm. pregnant woman uh, understood that loss that you're talking about, the psychological oh, costs of birth, mm. the, the identity, because that stuff does take so long to articulate. And I remember feeling enraged that mm. I'd go to my parents' house and my dad would offer my husband a beer because he'd been at mm. work. And I think, oh, I want a beer. Mm. I've been up all night, all day. Mm. Um, mm. No one offers mm. me a beer because I haven't been at work. But I've, I haven't had a poo by myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I haven't gone to the toilet without somebody clapping outside saying, good boy, mummy. <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you just don't get that moment yeah. of peace. And there's all that emphasis on the post-baby body rather than the post-baby <laughs> Self inside. There's so many yeah. things I wanted to talk. I wanted to talk about. So we're up to quarter past eight already, and we have 15 minutes of questions from the floor to take. Um, but yeah, we, if there aren't any questions, we'll pursue that because I want to look at the celebritisation too of <laughs> babies. But um, anybody got any questions for the panel? Oh yes, here they go. Um, we've got a microphone coming to you, sir. Uh, I'm one of those rare men who participated actively from conception onwards. And I spent quite a few months in uh, uh, maternity wards and, and so on. Uh, one of the things I used to have arguments with health nurses about rules and things, and my question is, rules keep increasing. I, I've been, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I've seen a lot of new rules come and go. But I think one of the things I, I find is that one thing that people don't say is that each child is an individual. Mm -hmm. That even though they have these rules, that they don't necessarily apply to your child. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to find out what you think of that. I was see when I had my um, second child. I have two, and I, by the second, I thought I was going to get a carbon copy, and it was a real and I, it was it was mm. a really good experience mm. for me having the second, where I was like she did everything mm. different. Yeah. She she looked different. She fed different. Her genitals were different. Mm. Um, the first was a boy, <laughs> but um, no, but <laughs> it was just everything, and it is that sense of and she slept differently. But I had it, you know, and it's a, there's a lot of pregnancy advice today that is very rules based. Yeah, and, and timetabling has kind of come back in fashion. Mm. Yeah, and, and then just, out again. Yeah, and, and you kind of, you have the second child and the subsequent ones, and you think, mm. oh, it's, it is actually beyond me. I can't control. Mm. I, can't I, control. I, think that's, I think it's really true. I think there are two things to say about that. One, that there are more rules, but they do change. And, and, and so the rules about, for example, when to feed solids to a baby and which solids to feed a baby, ha that has changed yeah. back and forth quite a bit in, in the last few years. So it can be very confusing. You can do the right thing with one kid, and by the time the next kid comes yeah. along, doing the same thing would be considered wrong. But what I say to parents in kid wrangling is, if a method doesn't work for you, and there's a lot of gurus, you know, people mm. often... Orthodoxies uh, around often, all this stuff. Often people, people who haven't had their own kids, often, mm. you know, people who... Um, Oh, some of them have any experience. Yeah, some of them yeah. just seem to be just deciding that's how it should be. 
And what I say to people, and I feel really strongly about this, is if the method doesn't work, don't blame yourself, blame the method. Mm -hmm. Try something else. And I try mm -hmm. to, in, in Kid Wrangling, which is a really thick, big book for looking after kids from naught to five, and it's that big because it's giving people choices. It's not saying you have to know all that stuff in the book. It's saying everybody's different. You're, and also, I think it's not discussed often enough, but, I'm, but um, you know, Jane's so onto this stuff that... Um, about the self that some mums have really different personalities to the kid. Mm. So the way that you interact with one child can be different to another. Um, mm. And there can be an almost built-in uh, antagonism mm. or, or approval, mm. um, depending on the personality of a child and a, and a parent. So. And having a, the, the breakdown of the village, you know, it's so wonderful if you've got someone in your street or your family who can say, listen love them, feed them. I remember my grandmother saying to me, no kid in Australia who's been offered three meals a day has ever starved to death. Don't worry. You know, and the two-year-old's refusing to eat everything. And, you know, it, I sort of think, well, that's right. You know, unless there's something really clinically wrong, but you need that common sense, the person who's been through all the trends sometimes to come back and say... I, I don't have much to add, except that I think you're absolutely right. There's enormous, infinite differences in individual temperament. And our task as parents is to uh, become expert on each baby's unique character and capabilities and needs. And therefore, we need respectful guidance much more than rules. And I think we need people who will assist us to make decisions, not be authoritarian mm. and prescriptive. Uncertainty. I think that's a really mm. important thing that's missing from a lot of you know, caring for children is this sense that you have to allow for uncertainty and not and be mistakes. afraid of it. Yeah. 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 And mistakes. You got and it wrong the first 18 times. And, and I know this is a really controversial thing, but sometimes you do come across people who enjoy your uncertainty, especially if it's the first time you've been uncertain in your life. And I do recognise one or two people along the way, particularly with my first child, who were quite sadistic in, in revelling in my discomfort and putting down the way I was feeding or the way I was holding or the pram Because it makes them or, feel better, even if it did they might be feeling feel worried. It's mo validation. Momentarily, it made them feel very and superior. And there's whole businesses. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made from, from new mothers. Fear. Yeah. Fear sells. Mm. Yeah, absolutely it I does. know, the whole equipment. We haven't even touched on, oh you know, the, the equipment. God. I saw a pram today in, in town on the way here where they've <laughs> never seen this one. I thought I'd seen it all in prams. The Kid, the baby is propped up like it's on a strap to a plank. It's actually vertical. Wow. And they the get pram. to walk faster. So it's, like, it's like there's a baby on a ladder with wheels. Just it can't be good. Wow. And it's sort of strapped down like a, a mummy in a sarcophagus. That is so, so bizarre. I'm telling you, you're going to see, I don't know what it's called, but it's the vertical pram. Yeah, but the gear and the pressure on the, you've got to have an Emma Lunga, you've got to have a three-wheeler, you've got to have a nick off. You know, people will tell you that you're doing it all wrong and, and they are they are best avoided. Although the one thing I would say, having, you know, like research is some advances are great and some of the advances in baby safety, like the, the, the rules for some things, are, are absolutely invaluable. The, the SIDS sleeping rules. Well, because SIDS has gone down so much, hasn't yeah, it? The, like, the, dramatically. You know, yeah. Dramatically. It's, it's yeah. really saved lives. Not the, giving the child brandy to you know, sleep. Don't, yeah, don't, don't <laughs> knock up a, a, a cot made of, <laughs> you know, of, of the billy cart from the, from the garage. You know, there's, I think some rules are good and I, and I think we have to acknowledge that some of those medical advances have really told us things that have helped to keep our families mm. safe as well. Mm. I, I'm just going to put... Also, I would like to go home with Jane because yeah, me too. everything she says <laughs> yeah. is good. Uh, yes, there's another question up the front here. Um, I'd just like to ask, I don't think you've really touched very much on the role of grandparents. Um, we're new grandparents. We've got a six weeks old first oh, grandchild. Congratulations. But very sadly, he's with his mum and with very bad postnatal depression. Oh, and I'm dear. just wondering what you would recommend we, our role would be and how we could help. Oh, gee, it's tough. Well, I had very bad postnatal depression and I think one of the things that was just loving non-judgment um, is really all you can do, a loving force. Lots of food is always great. <laughs> um, you know, really practical help. I think, and, and listening, being available and, and um, in a very low-key, 
almost invisible way. It's it's a tricky thing. Uh, but if somebody's at least mm -hmm. been open enough to say that they have postnatal depression, um, and I think reassuring them that it is a curable, very common issue and you can get through it um, and it's not because you've got the wrong instincts or um, but I think loving reassurance is very helpful. I'm sure that's true. Victoria is probably the best place in the world if you're going to have those kinds of difficulties to be. We have an extraordinary range of services in our state that, that exceed any available in the rest of the world to assist women with all sorts of difficulties with confidence. And I would encourage you, if she's really uh, feeling very uncertain, to get in touch with one of the early parenting services like like Tweddle or Masada's Mother Baby Unit, so, or in North Park. Yeah, and, okay. and these are really the envy of the world for the high quality care they provide. But they, they can help perhaps get symptoms a bit more in check. But then there's the, the, the path towards confidence as a mother, and that's where grandparents are so important mm. in um, affirming and encouraging and complementing and uh, providing, I think, the practical care you've talked about, but very much the uh, ensuring that having an optimistic view is a good thing to do. Mm. I hope she recovers very soon. That's um, that's very tough. Part of it too is um, reassuring somebody and helping them to understand that um, the right way forward for them is whatever method or whatever whatever decisions they hit upon. And sometimes it can just be good to get and I, and this may not apply at all, but just to get your head out of that fake world of TV ads and magazines where mm. it, it is celebritised, it looks perfect, it looks mm. clean, um, it's complete, it looks it, easy. it's just it's made fun. up. That's just, you know, really, as, mm. you know, if you, if you get out of your tracksuit pants in the first seven years, uh, who are you? I, I don't, <laughs> I, I just find that's th yeah. that sort of fake world that's presented to us. Um, is is just so corrosive, you know. It's, it's you know, in TV shows, what we measure ourselves against is is fictitious. Mm. But it, like TV shows where the baby dis they have a baby and then it disappears. I, got, I was quite obsessed with this last year. I was watching things like that. Um, that coach show, what was it called? Everyone loved it. It was a cult. Friday one. Night Lights. Friday Night I Lights. I love that show. Yeah, yeah fantastic but what happened to show. the kid? She has a baby and yeah. she's got two other kids and all this. And then the baby just disappears for the season and then occasionally appears and it was a very strange looking baby too. But oh. you look at a lot of, like, uh, the, yeah. the baby's disappeared as if the baby is a seamless thing. And it, what you said first, Kaz, tonight, I think that sums up a lot of it for me in terms of being a mother is and being pregnant was it is all-encompassing but you assume that you know to have a baby is to have a little bum yes. and then to have this little puppy and it's not like that at all it is a complete you know it changes how you go to the toilet it does like, and that know. just yeah between a little without a little hand between your ass and the toilet exactly seat, like, nice it's thing. on such a base level <laughs> but I, I also think too when you have that great divide too that does cause you depression like my girlfriends would come bouncing in like the spice girls i remember one of them saying to me in hospital yes yeah, so like what do you do all day and i was like oh well, I, I go into shopping obviously at lunchtime what the fuck do you think I do all day. This is what I do. Like, you know, but they were so. But you don't know. But there's a they great don't before know. and a great. I remember yeah. saying to a woman, "Do you watch TV all day?" And I had to go and find her yeah. 13 years later and say, "I'm sorry." <laughs> I but know. you just. It's because we don't, don't know. have that tribal it's also because life. Because we, we don't label this work respectfully. No, we don't. So, um, of course, we have a fantasy. We'll have discretionary time because you're asked, "When are you giving up work?" Mm. I want every mm. midwife to ask ask a woman when are you starting mm. work as a mother yeah. and it's a little transformation but it's a hugely make a big difference. different indicator of yeah. what she's going to do which is a double shift every day yeah. on call for the next shift no rdos no position description no, no pay <gasps> that first holiday no, you take no with the baby that's no holiday, no holiday. Oh, no, work. and oh, it's, it's an awful. exquisite form of labor in terms of pain it is. like mm. it's so mm. 
boring. It's so and boring. Tedious. I mean, you know, and the, and mm. when you're that tired, the idea, you know, like they rate torture if you kind of get woken mm. every few hours. And you, yeah, you, it is no, but it's true. Like in the first six months, if your mm. baby doesn't sleep through, mm. you are actually living into the definition of torture, and yet you're meant to just kind of get the joy, smell the joy, and, and but part of this. part of the part of the reason why we we don't give ourselves time to actually, you know, how when you hold a baby especially when it's not your own baby and you haven't yeah. been up all night, you kind of lose yourself in the time of it. And it does, you know, the baby's head d- does smell beautiful and it's, and it's mm. gorgeous, but Although it's it really, but it's, it's it, yeah, and it, it, all of those feelings of, you know, this tiny thing that I, that I need to look after and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, we don't allow ourselves even to feel that because we're supposed to be doing our hair and looking, mm. you know, so... The, the expectations are taking away the joyful, wonderful parts of it, which we haven't talked about much No, tonight. we haven't had a chance. No. And we're going to run out of time, but I do want to pose this question to each of you before we depart. Uh, if men had babies, dot, 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 can you start? There might be fewer of them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I can't top Kaz, that. No. Um, Oh, if men had babies, everything about everything would be different. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good answer too. Yeah, I Monica? think it's, it's on par with the, um, was it Gloria Steinem with the, if men had periods? I think you could just do oh, babies. They'd be measuring flow, <laughs> taking photographs, it'd be all over the place. Actually, I, I would say... Check out my cloche. I think there really would be medals. There would be medals. There would be medals. There'd be like awards nights like the Duration Oscars. Duration of birth, how many stitches. And, be, and there would be like, there'd be magazines called Perineum monthly (laughs) well on that note there's a publishing sensation in the making ladies and gentlemen would you please give a big round of applause to my guests Monica Ducks Kaz Cook and Jane Fisher thank you so much we will send you been a wonderful audience